Stan Gibalisco here. I'm going to discuss a topic in Chapter 3 of this book, Teach Yourself Electricity and Electronics, 5th edition. Actually, this topic is covered in all editions of Teach Yourself Electricity and Electronics. This particular copy, however, has the added benefit of having web-based explanations for the answers to the quizzes at the ends of the chapters. You can find those on my website at sciencewriter.net. You'll just, just go to the links that say uh, quiz explanations. And in addition, I have made videos, 100 videos, for each and every one of the final exam answers that explains those answers. So, and that only applies to the fifth edition. McGraw-Hill, copyright 2011, Stan Gibalisco, at your service. So let's just cut right to the, um, right to the chase. This uh, material is in chapter three. It has to do with a phenomenon called electrostatic deflection. Electrostatic deflection. That is the repulsive and attractive forces that have to do with electrostatic fields. Now that should not be confused with electromagnetic deflection. Electromagnetic deflection or simple magnetic deflection is the attraction and repulsion of magnetic poles either caused by electrical currents or by permanent magnets. But electrostatic deflection is, a, is an entirely different cause, but a very similar phenomenon in many ways. So if you uh, took physics in high school, or even in elementary school, I, I believe I saw this little trick right here, the, the, the object on the left. It has a spherical electrode on the top, an insulating lid, a conducting metal rod, a couple of foil leaves, all inside a glass jar. That glass jar does not have to be evacuated, although it could be. And these foil leaves just hang down. They're like a very thin aluminum or tin foil, something like that. When you apply an electrostatic charge to this electrode up here, say by shuffling around on a carpeted floor in a dry winter day in the northern part of the United States, such as where I live, Dakota Territory, United States of America. You shuffle around and cause an electrostatic charge to build up on your body. You've had that experience. You touch a grounded metal object and zap. You get nailed. The discharge occurs. Well, here, if you touch this spherical electrode, you will place whatever electrostatic charge is on your body. You will raise the potential of this entire assembly, the, in, the metal part of this assembly, to whatever the electrostatic voltage is on your body. And that body uh, voltage can get quite high, hundreds or even thousands of volts. It's just that there aren't that many charge carriers on you so that it can't produce enough current when you touch something to actually injure or kill you although if you I should make a, a remark that if you do get enough of an electrostatic charge on your body it, it can burn you or even kill you lightning is an excellent example remember those um, those stories about people's hair standing on end before they got struck by lightning they're not entirely fictitious because the same phenomenon that made their hair stand up made every hair repel every other will cause these foil leaves to repel each other. They have like electrostatic charge, either positive or negative, depending upon, I guess, the, what, what the soles of your shoes are made of and what the carpet is made of. Uh, and, uh, but whether it's positive or negative, these foil leaves will spring apart. They'll stand apart because they will repel each other in their own weight. Uh, counterbalances the repulsion to cause them to stand farther and farther apart as the charge 
gets greater and greater. So you, you may have seen that little trick. This uh, particular device is called an electroscope. That's kind of a strange name for it, isn't it? It almost looks like, is that something that you would, well, it's something that you can look at electricity with. And I guess back in the olden days, before they even really knew what charge carriers were, back in Benjamin Franklin's time, he uh, experimented with devices like this and other more dangerous electrostatic charge retention devices. For example, you might try Googling or using Wikipedia to look up this. Benjamin Franklin did experience, uh, experiments with this. You take a jar, you put a foil on the inside, foil on the outside, charge it up with a really high voltage and it'll stay charged. It's a capacitor. Ben Franklin um, actually got knocked almost unconscious by the discharge from one of these things. These are dangerous, these Leiden jar things. You, they think you, they're innocent enough. You know, an ordinary pickle jar. You put foil inside and outside of it, you can turn it into a deadly, deadly thing if you're not careful. But that's a little bit more uh, electrostatic discussion that I might do in another video. The charge that you get on your body from shuffling around on a carpet is not sufficient to endanger you under most circumstances. So again, this particular device is called an electroscope. Well, electrostatic deflection can be taken advantage of to actually measure high direct current voltages by means of a meter assembly similar to the Darsenval meter assembly that is used in electromagnetic deflection applications where you want to measure current with an analog meter. Remember those old analog microameters, milliameters? They still exist and they use a, a magnetic repulsion and attraction to produce deflection of a needle by force against a spring bearing. But you can do the same thing with electrostatic deflection. It just takes a much higher voltage to cause that deflection. Uh, the neat thing about a, a voltmeter like this, an electrostatic voltmeter, is that it draws essentially no current from the source. And that's a good thing with a voltmeter. You don't want to draw current with a voltmeter. Well, this thing can't draw current because there's no path for current to flow through. When you apply this DC voltage to this device, the needle deflects because these two plates here will attract each other. Opposite polarity. Normally, the spring and everything, the calibration is adjusted so that the needle rests over here at zero, and then when you apply these positive and negative high voltages, you get attraction between opposite electric poles between the fixed plate and the movable plate. And the as the voltage increases, the force increases, and the needle deflects farther and farther over upscale. So uh, you can actually measure kilovolts using a meter like this. Whereas with an ordinary volto milliameter or multimeter like the kind you have in your electronics home laboratory, you try measuring t 10 kilovolts with one of those, you're probably going to blow it up. But not with one of these if it's properly designed. That said, if you're going to measure high DC voltages, and I do mean high in the kilovolt range, be very, very careful. Take extreme precaution because those voltages can jump small gaps. The, the uh, voltage can be sufficient to overcome a small gap and you can get a shock. Well, it's more than just a shock. Uh, this happened to me when I worked at the, uh, when I played, I should say, in the ham radio station in the basement of the old Pioneer Hall dormitory at the University of Minnesota circa 1974 we had an old amplifier a ham radio linear amplifier that had been built 
by some of the people there and it used 3,700 volts on the plates of a, some kind of a vacuum tube. I don't remember what kind. I, it, I believe it was an 813 vacuum tube, but I could be mistaken there. Anyway, it produced 1,000 watts of power input and that 3,700 volts somehow or another found its way to uh, take a pathway through my right hand. It went in my index finger and out my thumb and it was an explosion like a firecracker, like a big firecracker, like a small stick of dynamite in my hand. And when I looked down and saw that my hand was still there, I was rather surprised because I wouldn't have been particularly surprised if that entire hand had been gone, burnt to a stub. That's what it felt like. And it took three months for the wound that that spark caused to heal. It killed all kinds of tissue in my right hand. I'm very lucky that I even have the use of that hand today. And even luckier that that current didn't take a path between my right and left hands through my chest cavity. Only the heavenly powers know what would have happened to me in that situation. So be very, very careful if you're going to mess around with voltages of any significance. Be very careful. You had better know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, stay away. But anyway, th this particular device over here, the electroscope, is innocent enough. And even children can play with these. In fact, if you have a kid who's uh, interested in electronics, I recommend that you <laughs> let, uh, let him or her play with it. Uh, things like this. Innocent little devices like this. Well... Stan Gibalisco has yammered enough here, so I will sign off. Once again, you can visit me, Stan Gibalisco, at sciencewriter.net. There's a bunch of links there for your edification and enlightenment and enjoyment and perhaps amusement. Signing off from the Black Hills of South Dakota, United States of America. Until next time, so long.